Hey everybody, I'm so excited about today. I love as I'm writing blogs, one thing I have found that I didn't know before I started writing is that God teaches me oftentimes while I'm writing things I don't know beforehand. It's one of the most exciting things ever and gives me great hope that I'm actually doing some things that God means for me to do that he started to do that in my life. So I hope what I'm gonna share with you today, I'm not even at the end of it. There's so many places my mind could go, but we've only got a little bit of time. So I'm gonna give you some of the, the powerful things that God has taught me through a story out of Mark 5. So we're at behind the blog number five. And I named it, Nothing and No One Has the Power to Stop Faith, Even Jesus. Hopefully that'll make sense by the end. In 1985, Jim Carrey wrote himself a check for $10 million and he put it in his pocket, or in his wallet. He dated the check for 1995 and in the memo it says, for acting services rendered. At the time he wrote it, he was a 21 year old sitting in his broken down Toyota parked on a hill overlooking Hollywood. As a young person, his family was so poor that he worked nights to help them make ends meet. They were actually kind of homeless at one point, lived in a trailer in a, a relative's yard. That's how bad his family life was. And he ended up dropping out of high school because he would work through the night and when he went to school, he was so exhausted he couldn't even listen and he thought, what's the point? But he was undaunted about becoming a million, millionaire and um, in, uh, what would I call it, entertaining the masses, making them laugh. So he wrote himself that check and he looked out at the world and believed he would be entertaining the masses one day and that he would be a multimillionaire. We know the rest of the story. In 1995, Jim Carrey was not making $10 million per film. He was making $20 million per film. That little story shows the power of true faith Jim Carrey tenaciously went after what he believed would make his life worth living. He would let nothing stop him, and he achieved it. What a happy ending to a sad beginning. I wonder what it's been like since Jim Carrey's dreams have all come true. I can tell you exactly what it's been like from his own mouth. This is a quote from Jim Carrey. I think everybody should get rich and famous and do everything they ever dreamed of so they can see it's not the answer. I told you that story not to be depressing, but to prove a point. If we believe something is true, the true answer to the problem or problems we're facing, we will go after it with everything in us. It's just the way we're wired. Jim believed money and success was the answer. Therefore, he poured his entire being into that one thing. He achieved it and found out the truth. Although it wasn't the answer, his actions proved he believed it was the answer. Most people, even prof professing Christians, never find the answer to life. I've worked in senior living. I've worked with people for years that were at the end of their lives, and most of them are unhappy insecure and not a whole lot different than they were in high school. What I have found is this thing we live in gets old. Our soul does not. Um, it can stay immature and like it was at five years old when you're 95 years old. It's an incredible thing. But for us to grow in this world and grow in our faith and grow closer to God, we have to absolutely work at it with everything in our being, everything around us fights against the life of God in us, everything. In working in senior living, I worked with hundreds of older people, and I'm trying to even think as I'm sitting here talking. There were probably two or three that I remember that died with great faith and confidence in God. It was a little bit depressing to tell you the truth, and I can't help but think that is kind of the way the world is, looking at that, looking around, even at people in church, like I said, I talk to a lot of people and most people do not have that powerful life that Jesus Christ died to give them. Most of them will chase everything that the world chases. They will live and die without this life that God said, I came, Jesus said, I came to give you life and give it to you to the full. 
It's tragic at best, and I truly believe it's blasphemous at worst. If we say what we believe and we don't produce any action with that, we don't believe it. James 2.17 says, in the same way, faith by itself, if it is not accompanied by action, is dead. That's James 2.17. I looked up dead in the Greek. It means dead. That's kind of funny, but it's the truth. It's necros, or necros, dead, what lacks life, not able to respond to impulses or perform functions. It's dead, it won't react to anything. So God's word is so simple and yet pro incredibly profound. We can argue against it and defend ourselves, but it will not hold up. If we believe, we will do. If we don't, we won't, period. The woman with an issue of blood blew me away this morning as I read chapter five of the book of Mark. She was healed from a disease from which she suffered for 12 years. Jesus said her faith healed her, not him. Mark 5, 25 and 26, and a woman was there who had been subject to bleeding for 12 years. All you ladies out there, can we imagine this? 12 years. She had suffered a great deal. She was sick. This wasn't just something that she could ignore. She had suffered a great deal under the care of many doctors, and she spent all she had. Yet, instead of getting better, she grew worse. Scripture says the woman heard about Jesus and was determined to get to him. The crowd was pressing in all around Jesus, but faith spurred her on to do whatever it took. Why did she make such an effort? The text plainly says she grew worse, Mark 5, 26. She probably was weak and didn't feel well at all. She may have felt like giving up, but she didn't. She believed touching him was the answer. It was life and death to her. Why didn't she cry out and ask him to touch her so she would be healed? I don't know all her reasoning, but I do know that under Old Testament law, which when Jesus came, it was still Old Testament law, that if a woman was bleeding, she was considered unclean. If someone touched her, they would become unclean. She circumvented asking him and went straight for his power. The Bible tells us her thought process. Think about this, guys. She knew, she knew he couldn't touch her. She knew that in her mind because she hadn't actually met Jesus. She had heard about Jesus. She knew who he was. So she knew in her unclean state, he couldn't touch her. We all know, looking back, he would have touched her. But that did not stop her. Mark 5, 28 says, For she thought to herself, If I can just touch his robe, I will be healed. She didn't say, if I can touch his robe, I might be. She said, I know if I can get to that part right there and just touch it, this is going to be the answer to everything. If I will. She did and she was. If we only realized how tenacious God wants us to be when we come to him, he loves it when we believe him hard. She thought to herself, is what scripture says, none of us know the power of what we think to ourselves. What rolls around in your head and in my head all the time is what will shape every single thing about us. It will either motivate us or suck the life out of us. She had only heard about Jesus. She believed what she heard and nothing was going to keep her from getting to him. None of us will experience Jesus until we believe what we hear about him and decide to go after him wholeheartedly ourselves. God always responds to a person who seeks after him with their entire heart. Always. I've read the scripture, I've read the Bible cover to cover. I don't even know how many times, probably more than 30 times, I don't know. Cover to cover. I have never seen a place in scripture or in real life where somebody wholeheartedly went after God and God said, nah, it does not happen. When people can't get to God, I always know it's cause you don't want to get to God.
You may want healing and you may want your problems to go away. You may want a healthy mind, but if it's not God you want, you will not get God. And God is perfect. To give you his gifts without giving you himself would be evil. So we don't get God till God is what we want. And we've got to put everything else aside and go, I'm going to get, just like that woman. I mean, God put this in here for a reason. That woman was like, I don't care. I'm going through this crowd being a weak person with an illness. Do you think that was probably easy for her to get to him? No way. But she was going to get through that crowd and do whatever she had to do. I wonder how many people were like, God, get, what are you doing? Because I'm sure that was hard for her to get through, but she was bound and determined to get to her God. Nothing, nothing, nothing will stop us but us. Look in the mirror. If you want to know who's stopping you from getting to God, it's the person looking back at you in the mirror. God will move heaven and earth to help us find him if we're serious. And most people are half-hearted and half-hearted will not. God never says, if you look at for me with half your heart, you will find me. It, it's not in scripture and it's not in reality. God is worthy of everything. And if we don't act on that truth, we will not know him. This has nothing to do with getting better first. We come to God with all our diseases, physical, mental, and emotional. Our sicknesses, and we all have them. I don't care who you are, if you're living on this planet, you got some sicknesses, whether they're physical, mental, emotional, all of them. We probably all got all of them, but we all have them and they're meant to drive us to him in our hopelessness. The woman that was bleeding, she, she didn't wait till she got a little bit better and thought, I'm gonna take this to Jesus. She probably would have died first. She let that horrible uncleanness press her into him. <clears throat> Under the Old Testament law, listen to this scripture. It's Leviticus 12, 4. This is talking about childbirth, but any kind of bleeding would have done the same thing. Then the woman must wait 33 days to be purified from her bleeding. She must not touch anything sacred or go to the sanctuary until the days of her purification are over, Leviticus 12, 4. She had to stop bleeding or she was unclean. Her uncleanness affected everything, her relationship to others and her relationship to God. She was not to, able to be a part of her people or go to the sanctuary. Her condition made her an outcast. Not only did she spend all of her money and put all of her hope in things that did 12 years. Can you imagine 12 years of nothing? Not only did you not get better, you get worse. You're trying with all your heart. It's a wonder she wasn't an atheist by that point, but she wasn't. She heard, there's another way to get better. There's somebody that can help me. And again, we know she believed it because she went after him. And I love her. Listen to this. She snuck up behind Jesus and she took his power without him giving it to her. Who is this God? You know what? That doesn't even make sense to me. If I didn't read stuff like this in scripture, I wouldn't believe it. When I really read scripture without looking at it like I've looked at it all my life and just let it speak, I'm like, who are you, God? By faith, she took that healing. I think she should be in Hebrews 11, and I would write it like this. By faith, the woman with the issue of blood took her healing without even asking. <laughs> And when you look in Hebrews 11, Hebrews 11, all those little, um, every single little uh, by faith that people lived by, it said by faith, Abraham did this. By faith, Moses did this. By faith, Sarah did this. It doesn't even say by God's power they did it, but their faith was honored by God. God has to put his faith in us. And he will put, it, it's a Greek word called pistis is faith. And it's God's inbirthed faith. We can't get that ourselves, but when God puts that faith in us and then we get up and act on it, you better watch out because God will move heaven and earth because he has given us that faith and he wants us to live by that faith. I don't know this on the level I want to know it and you probably don't either, but I'm going to work at it for all my life to try to get there. Jesus couldn't stop her from getting his healing he didn't even know what was happening. However, he felt power leave him and go into somebody else. Like he's walking around, the crowds are pressing in on him. But in that moment, he knew something supernatural had happened. He was walking along and the power of God, it didn't go out to every single person that touched him. 
because every single person that touched him did not have the faith that she had. But she had that faith that said, if I can get there and touch the hem of his garment, I'm going to be made well. So when she got there and did that, God honored that and the power inside of him to heal came out of him without him even realizing it happened. If I'm understanding scripture correctly, that's what happened. I'm just taking it as it says. Um, he didn't know he had received it, but when we move down here by faith, there is a power unleashed from heaven. The reason we don't see this power often is because we misunderstand why we're here. We are here to glorify God and enjoy Him. That's what we're here for. We're here to glorify Him, whatever that looks like, whether it's suffering, whether it's in a high position, whether it's in a low position, we are on this planet to glorify Him. And most of us see scripture and think, how can I get what I want? James 4, 3 makes it plain. When you ask, you do not receive because you ask with wrong motives that what you may spend, that you may spend what you get on your own pleasures. In God's eyes, motive is what matters. If he gives us what we lust for, we will only grow more selfish and self-centered. If we seek him because we know he is the answer to everything and he is worthy, he will give us himself and his healing. Jeremiah 29, 11. Most people stop at Jeremiah 20 or Jeremiah 29, 13. Most people stop at Jeremiah 29, 11. I know the plans I have for you. Everybody quotes that. But I want you to hear the rest of it. Jeremiah 29, 13 says, if. And when you see an if in the Bible, that depends on you. If. You have to do something. If you look for me wholeheartedly, you will find me if you will it's a promise and god cannot lie what would happen if we all looked for god like this she looked with her whole heart she believed with her whole heart she found him she touched his garment and a miracle happened he did not become unclean she became clean i talked to many people many people with problems that are way over my head they are desperate and rightly so to act as if this world is friendly and, and a comfortable place is delusional. All of us have real problems, both physical and emotional. God put this woman with an issue of blood into scripture for a reason. He wanted us to emulate her. He wanted us to look at her example and say, if he did it for her, he'll do it for me. She had been to every doctor she could find, spent all she had, and had only grown worse. She believed doctors could fix her or she wouldn't have given them all her time and all her money. She found out they were not the answer, but it took 12 years for her to truly believe it. She was not a half-hearted woman. We can take every medicine to dull our minds. We can see every counselor, but I know for a fact, unless we get to Jesus, we will only grow worse. This world does not have the answer. No human has the answer to anything. After I listen to people tell me their hopeless situations, I usually completely ignore their situation and tell them how to get to God. Our situations are never the problem. Yes, I said that. Our situation, you may think, oh, you don't know my situation. You don't know some of the situations I've been in. They've been so far over my head. If people at times had known what I was believing God for, they would have put me in an insane asylum because it sounded so crazy. Yet I'm sitting right here and I'm talking about God and his ability to do what he says. And I can speak on it with authority because he took me into some of my greatest fears and into problems that were so far over my head that there was nobody but God that could help. I couldn't go to family members or anybody else because they would have been like, ain't nothing we can do. Yet he, yet he came into those places and he made me whole through them. At this point in my life, I don't care if he fixes anything. I just want God. I feel like Job. I had heard about you with my ears, but now I've seen you with my eyes. Therefore, I despise myself and repent in dust and ashes. And what I get from that with Job is upon hearing from God, he said, I don't care where I am and I don't care what you do. You're enough for me. God gave him the greatest gift and that's what he wants to give all of us, himself. Honestly, the lack of God's power and presence is our only problem ever. 
Jesus will never tell us he has no idea what to do, ever. It's not gonna happen. Until we believe that, we will chase counselors, another man or woman, money, sex, and every other thing to make us whole. Look at your life, what is your focus? Whatever the answer to that question is will be what you pour all your energy, money, and time into. If it's the pursuit of God, you will find him and get all his healing. If it's anything else, you will only grow worse. Francis Brooke wrote a, a, a song and one of the stanzas says, my goal is God himself, not joy, nor peace, nor even blessing, but himself, my God. Tis his to lead me there, not mine, but his at any cost, dear Lord, by any road. And I just wanna end on this. Jesus made her not only physically whole, he went on to, to restore her dignity in front of everyone. He could have just gone on knowing she was healed, but he did so much more for her than that. He turned around and said, who touched me? She came to him trembling and came at his feet because she was afraid because she knew she had taken it. He didn't give it to her, she had taken it and she probably thought she was in trouble. But he said to her these words, daughter, he called her daughter. He said, daughter, your faith has made you well. Go in peace and be healed of your disease. He made sure everybody heard, heard him. He gave her back her place in society, her dignity, all those things that had made her an outcast. He gave it back to her. And you know what I noticed this morning as I read? I got to, that's uh, Mark chapter five. I got to Mark chapter six. And Jesus was in a little area and words, y'all know, you live in a little area, everybody finds out your business in no time. But listen to how Mark chapter six ends. And I can't help but think it was because of this woman and what she did and what Jesus did in front of the whole area. It says, and whenever, this is Mark 6, 56, and whenever he came in villages, cities, or countryside, they laid their sick in the marketplaces and implored him that they might even touch the fringe of his garment. And as many as touched it were made well. Look what she started. What are you gonna start?